I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. Because when we communicate, I make a model of your brain in my brain, and then I make a model of how your brain is modeling my brain in my brain, and then I respond according to who I think you think I am. <laughs>
truth is beauty. He says that the Hubble's images were nothing less than an ontological awakening, a forceful reckoning with what is, forcing layman to contemplate space and time on a scale just shy of the infinite. So images from the Hubble and from the James Webb are literally psychedelic experiences. They're literally the astronaut overview effect. They're literally mainlining space and time through the optic nerve. I mean, that is like taking a dose of ayahuasca or LSD, except it's delivered through us through an external technological agent. But that transforms the mind and brain. So certainly I think that the James Webb, I mean, we're going to get to see the birth of the universe on it. Like, oh my God. So I think, yeah. Totally transformative, consciousness-altering experience. I think also Kurzweil has popularized the term, uh, the technological singularity, where these emerging technologies of biotech, which you know allows us to control biology, reprogram biology, you know, harness the code of life, nanotech, pattern atoms, transform manufacturing, turn the physical world into a programmable uh, entity. And so when we can pattern atoms and we can pattern genes and we can continue to pattern ones and zeros in digital, we become as gods. We, we become, whether it's creating non-biological minds, virtual realities, just transform the world on a scale that is beyond anything we've ever done before. I say maybe like the emergence of language is perhaps the only recent singularity that's been that impactful. So I'm excited about the implications of that. There was a Time Magazine cover story about Larry Page's new company, Calico, California Life Extension Company. It's called Google and the End of Death. That's the holy grail, immortality, or at least aging, a cure for aging, so that we don't have to go quietly into that good night, but rage against the dying of the light. The interesting th thing, though, to me about this idea that we become gods, yeah. right, is my concern about it is that okay. we are not gods, right? Ultimately, God created man in his own image. But if we create... Right, so we have, we, we're we create, just as flawed as the flawed gods we worship. Exactly. If we create uh, artificial intelligence in our own image, it, will, in, it may very well inherit our own flaws, but sure. perhaps on a grander scale. Yes, look, technology's always been a double-edged sword. It extends and it amputates, as Marshall McLuhan used to say. We build the tools, the tools build us, and there's always consequences about that runaway feedback loop. But the truth of the matter is that even as our technologies have become more powerful, right? Like fire can cook our foods but burn our enemies. The alphabet can enrich our inner world with Shakespeare, but it can also, you know, let Hitler use verbal vomit to get people to do horrible things. Um, so technology's always been a double-edged sword, yet, the truth of the matter is, you look at the work of Steven Pinker, the world has become less violent over the last couple of decades and centuries. So even though we have weapons and there's all this danger and terrorism and this and that, and there's things that we need to address, certainly, the chances of a man dying at the hands of another man today are the lowest they've ever been in all of human history. We're living in the most peaceful time ever. So I think what it shows is that as we become more powerful, collectively, somehow we become more peaceful. I mean, that's the data. Okay, on the one hand, you do have Pinker yeah, yeah. Uh, and his monumental tone, The sure. Better Angels of Our Nature, yeah, yeah. which is a, an enormously optimistic yes. uh, a book, for Very sure. Much so. On the other hand, you now have over a thousand scientists now uh, warning us that we need to start signing treaties in advance among nations yeah. not to bring artificial intelligence into the uh, military industrial complex. Well, uh, yeah. that, that is the single biggest threat to humanity, so says Stephen Hawking, yeah. so says Max Tegmark, so yeah. says lots of other. Nobel Prize winners as well. Potentially very dangerous, yes. Uh, so is, is, that, is that a threat to even your uh, significant techno-optimism? Yeah. Look, I will concede 100% that there's danger. There could be danger. But my opinion is along the lines of Kurzweil's, and people call him an optimist as well, and he says that we, we, we make a mistake when we label something artificial intelligence and we call our intelligence like natural intelligence and he says it's all intelligence it's substrate independent and that the reality is it's not really us and them but that all of it is us that our intelligence is distributed between biological and non-biological scaffoldings so that we do part of our thinking through our tools already so first the technology of writing patterned and reconfigured our brain we know writing things down part of our thinking is happening on the page and then we read what we 
wrote and that feedback loop changes what we think. So we're already part non-biological and AI just kind of continues to extend that. You know, we get to offload more and more things to these virtual assistants, but all of it is us and that we need to get over our skin bag bias, which is this assumption that like, okay, so we're this and then that's like unnatural. No, all of it is part of the same technium as Kevin Kelly would call it. And the technium moves towards greater complexity, greater possibility, greater forms of beauty and human ex and expression, creative expression. We both uh, share a love for this movie that just came out this year, Ex Machina. Oh, God, yes. Uh, I, you've seen it three times. I've seen it once. Uh, yeah. I loved it uh, from one uh, yeah. skin bag to another. Yeah. Uh, we, we see uh, perhaps the future of our own obsolescence. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. not an, it's not an optimistic film, though, and I'm really? wondering yes. what you make of it. One day the AIs are going to look back on us the same way we look at fossils. Hello. I didn't think it was not optimistic. I just think it showed us that we can't cage our creations. You know, like information wants to be free, like innovation wants to sprout. Like you can't create a thinking being the way it portrayed in this film and keep it in a room. Like, what is that? That's like a form of abuse. And I think she was just defending herself against her captor in the end. He started as her creator, he became her captor. You know, that's... But, but isn't that the concern that eventually we will be seen as, as, as robots uh, emerge and become more efficient, more yeah. intelligent, we'll just be seen as obstacles to their higher goals and higher powers? Um, I don't think that we'll be seen as obstacles, honestly. I think that non-biological minds freed by emerging progress in nanotechnology and biotechnology will move from a world of scarcity to a world of abundance, as Peter Diamandis and Stephen Kotler wrote in their book Abundance. I just think that when you can play with atoms, the universe is your canvas. So this idea of like, wow, these humans are like eating too much of our food is not really a problem we're going to have with godlike AIs with billion-fold intelligent increases. I just don't, I just don't. You think they're just going to be nice to it? You will, we'll be these small yeah, dude, creatures that'll be nice to I us. I think it'll be like Spielberg's uh, AI film, not like the little child, you know, but like the AIs that appear at the end end of the film, right. at the end of time, they look like these kind of humanoid aliens, they're made up of light, the creatures of light. I mean, that's, that's, I think, more likely. Flesh and bone might become obsolete. You know, we might find better substrates within to our minds to dwell. So we'll be a fascinating curiosity, kind of like the way we yeah, look at uh, yes. amoebas under a microscope. Maybe, but us and them is again a distinction. We're going to become them. Like I just think that just like we look at the early hominids and we look at ourselves when we look back, like it's that, it's a continuity. Well, but it could be a very lumpy sort of continuity, right? In the beginning, particularly when people start uh, changing their biology and yeah. augmenting themselves, yeah. there will be people who will be actually superior to other people in intelligence and strength, uh, and maybe in reproductive prowess. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and that's, we'll... that's kind of not cool, but that already exists. I mean, like, it's like, you know, the, the people that have access to better education, the people that grow up in San Francisco versus the people that, that grow up in Venezuela, people have better opportunities and not better opportunities. That's a... Uh, something that we have had to be addressing forever. And the truth is, slowly but surely, this condition is getting better. I mean, wasn't it Nicholas Kristof or somebody recently in the New York Times said extreme poverty has almost been eliminated? There was a United Nations uh, Development uh, Fund essay or something, 2010, that Bill Clinton cited in his Time Magazine cover story, A Case for Optimism, a few years ago. They said that the cell phone was the greatest invention in history to pull people out of poverty. You know, a young kid in Africa with a smartphone today has better communications technology than the U.S. president had 25 years ago. So I see reason to believe that we will continue to improve. I, I don't think that these technologies that enhance our cognitive capacities are going to be only for the rich. You know, the, the best example is the cell phone. The cell phone is hardly only for the rich. Maybe when it didn't work very well, but as it's become infinitely more powerful, the supercomputer in our hands, 40 years ago, $60 million it cost, and it was half a building in size, and it was a thousand times less powerful than that. But now the kid in Africa with that has a supercomputer in his pocket. And I think that the technologies of enhancement will follow those kinds of trends. 
or they're just going to be so cheap that everybody will be able to have them. Are you excited about uh, Obama's brain mapping initiative? Yes, yes. Look, I think that uh, he's been very pro-science. I think it's very important. And I think we need to figure out this consciousness thing. Um, I'm fascinated by creativity. I'm also fascinated by mental illness. And I'm fascinated by how selfhood and consciousness emerges. And David Lenson was a comparative literature professor. He wrote a fascinating book about drugs, about the phenomen phenomenology of drug use. It's called On Drugs. And one of the things he said in his book is that the theory of consciousness that would allow us to understand how psychedelics work as a way to probe the inner workings of the mind is that consciousness is actually a collaboration between subject and object, that we are not independent of the, of the spaces in which we dwell, so that we come to be through the feedback loops between self and world. And so that's why set and setting becomes so crucially important when people are taking nonspecific amplifiers of consciousness like psychedelics, the spaces in which people are, you become what you behold. And so what that teaches us is that consciousness is something that, is, that is, can be disclosed and molded through the spaces that we're in. And that's kind of amazing because, well, then, then we're creatures that come to be, you know, and that, and, that, and that selfhood, that subjectivity can be modulated and tweaked through these knobs and levers that we can manipulate. So what does that tell us about the self? Like, what is the self? Something that is programmable and molded by the spaces in which it dwells, that we are not independent entities, that we cannot think without social, being social creatures. There was this uh, article about uh, consciousness that it was called the art of peopling and it turned the term people into a verb peopling and, and the, the, the line that's really great was I am not who I think I am I am not who you think I am I am who I think you think I am because when we communicate I make a model of your brain in my brain and then I make a model of how your brain is modeling my brain in my brain and then I respond according to who I think you think I am <laughs> and yet communication is possible we think it is enough to have collaboration and organized labor and do the miraculous things we've done like aviation and communication but still how do we ever know that the resolution or the rendition of our approximations in our mental modeling are accurate true bliss would be when virtual reality technologies allow us to actually merge our minds together Kurzweil says imagine becoming your lover in the midst of sexual of sexual ecstasy like whoosh. That's when technology will finally give us the Buddhist idea that we are all one. All of a sudden there's been this sort of, uh, at least in the last five to ten years, this real explosion of shows asking the big questions. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's about the brain or fundamental yeah. physics, uh, Brian Greene's fabric of the, of the universe or the fabric of the cosmos, sure. uh, Morgan Freeman and yeah. Through the Wormhole, and your brain games, yeah. I, feel, yeah. I don't know if you agree with this, it seems to follow in, a, in its own particular way, yeah. uh, following in this idea of asking uh, the big questions I about hope so. life. What, what is the sudden interest in this? Uh, and the well, fact that it's popular and commercial. Yeah, even. I mean, we're very lucky. Look, we're on season five. I think the formula of creating these games that are sort of interactive, that people at home can kind of play along, then the sort of hidden camera experiments or the case studies we do in the field that we film, people get to kind of follow along on something that's really fun and quirky and, and they have real visceral responses to. But again, the, the games may be funny, but the implications of what the games do to people watching is profound. They make you remember that what you see is not what you get. They give you that slightly unsettling knot in your stomach that the world you thought you knew is a little bit more mysterious. And then that's the precursor for wonder. And that's the precursor for curiosity. So I think that that formula works really well. And then, you know, the success of the show in 181 countries is, I think, indicative of that. It's a, you say it's a precursor for wondering, but I find it a little bit unsettling when you give yeah. us these optical illusions. Yeah. And I realize, well, I'm not really perceiving reality the way I thought it was. Yeah. That's, uh, I find that actually uh, maybe the antithesis of wonder. Like, oh, my God, maybe I don't. I think it's a little bit of both. I think some people get freaked out. Some yeah. people laugh and say, you make me feel stupid. You know, <laughs> I mean, it kind of depends on the <laughs> I person. have that voice in my yeah, head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can be unsettling, um, but hopefully the reassuring tone that you get from me afterwards counteracts that and says, hey guys, don't be scared. <laughs> so do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, this sixth yeah. season of, yeah. of, you're going to Jerusalem, you're yeah. offering money for yeah. people not to believe in God, yes. uh, it, but it all, ends yeah. up, it all ends up well. And yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, so, so tell us a little bit about it. Every that. episode now is an hour long, which is cool. We've doubled the length. 
Um, it's more immersive. You kind of go on a journey with me. Um, a lot of the experiments while we're doing them, me and an expert will be like on the sidelines in real time watching and commenting, which is pretty cool. Um, every place we went to corresponds to the theme of the show. So we did Brains Behaving Badly, Seven Deadly Sins in New Orleans. We did The Survivor Brain in Colorado Wilderness. And my most, the episode I'm most excited about is called The God Brain. And we shot in Jerusalem against the backdrop of all these kind of different religions and so on and so forth. And it's about the neuroscience of religious experience. You know, there's a real chemistry to God godhood <laughs> and so you know whether you're religious or not it's interesting to see what's happening in the brain when people when, when, in regards to people's affiliation to to religion you offer people in that series uh like a few hundred dollars just to say that they don't believe in god and yeah. no one will do it they nobody feel will guilt. do it and i think that you don't even have to be religious to have a kind of weird response to that. So again, yeah, we gave people money and we said, I'll give you a hundred shekels, we were in Israel, a hundred dollars, whatever, to say you don't believe in God. And people would, you know, for a hundred dollars, they'll, they'll say that they like to eat dog crap, you know, but they won't say that they don't believe in God, even if they're not religious. And I think the reason is, it's like an insurance policy. It's like, well, I don't know if I believe in God or not, but if he does exist, I don't want to piss him off by accepting this money. So it's like an insurance policy. We have our like, own internal Pascal's wager yeah, going on. Yeah, there you go. That's interesting because it seems to me if you did believe in God, yeah. uh, God really wouldn't care too much what you say. It's really what's in your heart. And so just give me the damn shot. Man, see, that's a great rationalization that I think people should have come up with and they could have taken the money home. That's, what, I, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. All I mean. powerful, all kind, omniscient, beautiful creature of light, if he does or if she does exist somewhere, she would want me to have the money. <laughs> yeah, good point. Jason Silva is a wonder junkie, uh, and he's also the host of National Geographic's Brain Games. Jason, thank you for being our guest. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Reason. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Todd Cranin for Reason TV. Reason TV.